perfumes. In mystic symbolism, a perfume is an olfactory hallucination. Its opposite olfactory hallucination is the stink. Perfumes are perceived as pleasant and good. Stinks are perceived as unpleasant and bad. The association of the devil with the hallucinated smell of sulphur and rotten eggs was often experienced by those who used exorcism to drive out demons, but there are many more forms of stink. Some hallucinatory perfumes have a key place in proving, at least to those who experience them, if not the rest of the world, that we experience only spirit. And the reason is that some perfumes have no physical equivalent. They are unbelievably uplifting, but cannot be described. Walt Whitman, Leaves of Grass Houses and rooms are full of perfumes. The shelves are crowded with perfumes. I breathe the fragrance myself, and know it and like it. The distillation would intoxicate me also, but I shall not let it. The smoke of my own breath Echoes, ripples, buzzed whispers, love root, silk thread, crotch and vine, my respiration and inspiration. Where do perfumes come from? There are people whose destiny and whose abilities mean they cannot, are even prevented from having other sorts of experience. Thus, they will never have a visual hallucination, never had an audible hallucination, never have a gustatory hallucination, nor will they ever have an out-of-body experience or near-death experience. They may be denied a past life experience, may never wish to try a fire-walking or lucid dreaming or kundalini or levitation, and they may feel just a dash lonely, with no feedback and no obvious proof that what they believe in exists. And this becomes even more important when they have an important role to play within the great work, are, in a sense, a key player. How to keep them going? How to show them their work is important? And the answer is the perfume. The Big Idea, number 5, Oliver Sacks, by Suzanne Coven, July the 9th, 2013. Oliver Sacks. This comes up, this sort of thing, strongly in people with olfactory hallucinations. They often say, not only can I not describe this, I never experienced it. I don't know what associations to make. Coven. Almost like a visitation. Or would you say hallucinations sometimes come from a part of the person that isn't part of the self? Oliver Sacks. Yes, well, that's what the muse is. So a perfume is concocted by our muse, our higher spirit, the composer. And it is intended as a booster, a motivator, almost a reward for keeping going when other signs of spiritual presence are missing. Perfumes can even be smelt by those who cannot physically smell. It is possible to experience a perfume even when one is totally physically unable to smell anything. In other words, the olfactory organs have been destroyed. The Anonymous Testimony by Perfume Experiencer 
In my case, I have no idea whether the perfume could be smelled by other people because no one else was there to smell it. But I noticed it always came when I was feeling alone and overwhelmed by the magnitude of the project I had undertaken. I came to the conclusion that since I did not have the gift of direct communication with my higher spirit and was unable at that stage to see visions, that the smell was to show me that the spirit world was still with me. I never got suicidal, just overwhelmed by the amount of data and work involved, but it seems that the aim was the same. The perfume I was given was unrecognisable, pine-like and flower-like at the same time. Perhaps of more interest is that my sense of smell was destroyed by pharmaceuticals several years back, so to smell anything at all was a sort of miracle. Incidentally, having smelt it, you want to breathe in more and more. It is truly addictive. Perfumes may be detectable by others. Perfumes may be detectable by other people besides who they are intended for. But you may ask, how can they be? They are an hallucination. Is it possible to have a shared olfactory hallucination? Two examples. W.B. Yeats, a vision. Sweet smells were the most constant phenomena. Now that of incense, now that of violets or roses or some other flower and as perceptible to some half-dozen of our friends as to ourselves, that upon one occasion, when my wife smelt hyacinth, a friend smelt eau de cologne. A smell of roses filled the whole house when my son was born, and was perceived there by the doctor, and my wife, and myself, and I have no doubt, though I did not question them, by the nurse and servants. Such smells come most often to my wife and myself when we pass through a door or are in some small enclosed place, but sometimes would form themselves in my pocket or even in the palms of my hands. When I took my hands out of my pocket on our way to Glastonbury, they were strongly scented, and when I held them out for my wife to smell, she said, Mayflower. The Glastonbury thorn, perhaps. I seldom knew why such smells came, nor why one sort rather than another. There is a clue here. When my wife smelled hyacinth, a friend smelled eau de cologne. The communication being given to one higher spirit, to your own, may be experienced by you in one way, but others may also be able to detect this transmission but they may not necessarily experience it in the same way. To you it may be an unknown perfume, a delicious smell. To them it may be just an ordinary scent. William J. Macmillan, The Reluctant Healer This particular Sunday morning, all the supposed emotion of the past weeks arose and overwhelmed me. Finally, I achieved sufficient measure of self-control to get up and dress. I made myself take the short journey to the beach. I went in swimming, hoping that the exercise would help to lift my almost suicidal unhappiness. The laughter and gaiety of the crowd with their picnic baskets, surrounded with family and friends, was too much for me. I fled back to the city. Once in my hotel room, I knew I must change my clothes and go out for dinner or... Anyway, I knew I must get out of that room. I went to the best restaurant in Oslo. After dinner, I felt impelled to take a walk through the palace gardens. I was standing on the street corner across from the opera house with traffic rushing by when I became aware of an unbelievably delicious scent. At first I thought it came from the gardens, then I realised these were a quarter of a mile away. I looked about me, 
but there was no one standing near who seemed a likely source of this perfume. The traffic let up for a second, and I dashed over to the other side of the street. Here I stopped to look at the bill posters advertising coming attractions at the Opera House. The scent increased steadily. People passing me turned to gaze at me as they passed. Several laughed. Suddenly I knew it was I who was the focal point of this perfume. I walked as rapidly as I could across the square into the palace gardens. Here I tried to find a secluded bench, but they were all occupied. Eventually I did find a stone seat against a wall. I tried to analyse what the scent was. While it was not anything I could place, it was vaguely familiar. It had something of the sweetness of syringa, but it contained an astringent quality. It was indescribably refreshing. My depression lifted as though it had never existed. I wanted to sing or dance or do something to express the energy and joy which flooded me with every inhalation of this perfume. It had now lasted half an hour, and it was as pungent as in the beginning. To return to my hotel I had to walk along a street fairly well filled with strolling couples. I hoped they would not notice me. It was a forlorn wish. My passage was marked by turning heads and suppressed laughter. I was torn between agonies of acute self-consciousness and profound gratitude to heaven for having restored me inside and out. I wished most heartily heaven would use less unusual and public methods. So actually, although the perfume is being created for one person by the composer of this one person, the spiritual signal that caused it to be created is available for everyone to pick up, and we will never know what experience, if any, it is giving them. And this is because it is actually impossible to describe a scent. Perfume Rachel Hertz, J.E. Godfrey Editors in Neurobiology of Sensation and Reward Boca Racton, Florida CRC Press Telefrancis 2011 Chapter 17 Frontiers in Neuroscience Perfume qualities are described in musical metaphors not solely because of the aesthetic relationship between perfume and music but because there are so few specific words dedicated to olfactory experience, anthropologists have found that in all known languages there are fewer words that refer explicitly to our experience of smells than there are for any other sensation. Glasson, House and Synod, 1994. In English, aromatic, fragrant, pungent, redolent and stinky exhaust the list of adjectives that specifically describe olfactory stimuli and nothing else. More common terms used to describe odours, like floral or fruity, are references to the odour-producing objects, flowers and fruits, not the odours themselves. We also borrow terms from other senses. Chocolate smells sweet, grass smells green, and so on. Hertz, 2005-2008 In other words, whether the olfactory sensation comes by the nose, when we call it a scent or smell, and consider it real, or it comes by our composer when we call it an olfactory hallucination, and also consider it real, even though it isn't. In practice, both are unique experiences. The sort Dr. David Chalmers describes when he questions how an experience is manufactured in consciousness. Perfumes can come from spirit beings. Perfumes can come from spirit beings. Thus, even though a person may be considered dead, they may still be there through the odours that were their signature scents. 
Rick Hinton. Phantom Odors, another piece of the puzzle in the paranormal world. The South Side Times, April 23rd, 2020. Have you ever woken up to the smell of breakfast cooking, yet no one is in the kitchen? Or smelled a strong whiff of cologne or perfume in the air when being the only one in the house? Or had the odour of flowers and you have no plants in the home? Or perhaps the smell of wet animal fur, much like after a bath, when there are no longer any animals in the residence? If so, you may very well have had a paranormal encounter, and not even being cognizant, it has happened. Phantom odours are a very familiar component in the realm of paranormal investigations. Unexplained smells from reported experience have included food cooking, bread baking, tobacco, cigarettes, cigars and pipes, cologne, perfume, deodorant, hairspray and body odours. These odours seem to always tie in with a former resident and their stroll through life. They may have become a calling card of sorts. And another example. Town Z, G and FF Folks, M. True Ghost Stories, London, Senate, 1936. An infinitely more peaceful psychic manifestation is associated with the Little Oratory, which I instituted at Raynham in memory of Townsend. It has always been customary to burn incense on the anniversary of our return to the Great House, but we were once absent when the anniversary came round. However, at twilight, the sweetness of incense breathed a benediction over the great house, pervading every nook and corner so noticeably that the housekeeper came running to see who had done this thing. However, the charcoal did not glow, and the spices remained lifeless, and she returned to her room, no wiser than when she came, but always followed, she said, by the perfume of the non-existent incense. The Book of Theophanies Theophany is a personal encounter with a deity. That is an event where the manifestation of a deity occurs in an observable way. Traditionally, the term Theophany was used to refer to appearances of the gods in ancient Greek and in Near Eastern religions. For Christians and Jews, Theophany refers to an event where God reveals his presence to a person. Henry Corbin, Alone with the Alone, from the Book of Theophanies by Ibn Arabi. Listen, O dearly beloved, I am the reality of the world, the centre of the circumference. I am the parts and the whole. I am the will established between heaven and earth. I have created perception in you only in order to be the object of my perception. If then you perceive me, you perceive yourself. But you cannot perceive me through yourself. It is through my eyes that you see me and see yourself. Through your eyes you cannot see me. Dearly beloved, I have called you so often, and you have not heard me. I have shown myself to you so often, and you have not seen me. I have made myself fragrant so often, and you have not smelled me. Savorous food, and you have not tasted me. Why can you not reach me through the objects you touch, or breathe me through sweet perfumes? Why do you not see me? Why do you not hear me? Why? 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 For you my delights surpass all other delights, and the pleasure I procure you surpasses all other pleasures. 
For you I am preferable to all other good things. I am beauty, I am grace. Love me, love me alone. Love yourself in me, in me alone. Attach yourself to me. No one is more inward than I. Others love you for their own sakes. I love you for yourself. And you, you flee from me. Dearly beloved, you cannot treat me fairly. For if you approach me, it is because I have approached you. I am nearer to you than yourself, than your soul, than your breath. Who among creatures would treat you as I do? I am jealous of you over you. I want you to belong to no other, not even to yourself. Be mine, be for me as you are in me, though you are not even aware of it. Dearly beloved, let us go toward union, and if we find the road that leads to separation, we will destroy separation. Let us go hand in hand. Let us enter the presence of truth. Let it be our judge, and imprint its seal upon our union forever.